Good evening, dear Medioscope viewers. Welcome to This Week in Turkey. Platforms will have to comply with the content removal and data storage requests of the Turkish government. The fines are the outlined by the new social media bill. If the tech giants can only one fourth of fines will be collected. The Transportation and Infrastructure Deputy Minister Fatih Sayan announced the fines in a series of tweets on October 3rd. In his tweet, Sayan indicated that Turkey's aim is not to be in conflict with providers, but to be respected and obeyed just like other countries. The social media platforms did not comment on being p Overall, only the Russian social media platform V Contacte complied with the social media bill. In October, Facebook announced that it is not going to appoint a Turkey-based representative neither for Facebook nor for its subsidiary Instagram. According to the social media legislation, the Turkey-based representatives are obliged to abide by the tightened government control on social media. Tech giants are asked to store user data, remove unwanted content, and report the company performance on a regular basis. President Erdogan views social media as immoral, especially after insults were directed at his daughter and son-in-law when they announced their fourth baby. This incident was followed by the new social media regulation. Turkey has a history with blocking access to social media platforms like YouTube, Twitter and Wikipedia for brief periods. France's Minister of Interior, Gerard Darmanin, announced that the country officially banned the Turkish ultra-nationalist organization, the Grey Wolves. This decision came following a series of disturbances instigated by the group in the country. According to the tweet by Darmanin, the reason for the ban of the group was because it incited discrimination and hatred and has been repeatedly involved in violent actions. Darmanin also said many of the violent acts of the group were led by Ahmet Çetin, a 23-year-old French Turk who was tried in France for inciting hatred after publishing a video on Instagram in which he asked the Turkish government to provide him with a weapon and 2,000 euros and that he would do what is necessary across France. The group, which has links with the Nationalist Movement Party in Turkey, most recently became notorious for organizing Hunt for Armenians marches and for vandalizing the Armenian Genocide Memorial in light of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Turkey's Ministry of Foreign Affairs has criticized France's move, saying that Turkey will react to this decision in the harshest way. The freedom of association, expression and demonstration of the Turkish community in France should be protected within the context of universal human rights and regulations, said the ministry. The ministry further noted that the decision showed that the French government has become completely captive of the Armenian circles, saying that France ignored the rising incitement of the fanatical Armenian diaspora within its borders. The grave walls were established at the end of the 1960s in Turkey by MHP as a militant wing. The group is responsible for triggering chaos in the streets in 70s and 80s when its members fought leftists and were responsible for many assassinations. Their salute symbol, with the thumb touching the tips of the middle two fingers and the index and little fingers raised, is seen by many as neo-fascist and was banned in Austria last year. A ban has also been considered in Germany. Our first guest this evening is Yunus Sozan. Mr. Sozan is an assistant professor of political science at Le Moyne College in Syracuse, New York. Good evening, Mr. Sozan. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, hello. So I know the results are not in yet and the race continues and uh, the result looks quite close. It seems that the next few hours will also be quite stressful. Um, Trump has already attempted to suggest that the elections have been rigged as the return to the White House seems to be less unlikely for him, less likely for him, sorry. Uh, before speaking about the future of uh, US and uh, Turkish relations, could you tell us perhaps about the atmosphere around uh, around you um, since Tuesday yeah. and perhaps also during the uh, election period, the campaign period? Yeah, so uh, everybody knows that like, the campaign period was extremely tense and everybody, even from outside the US, everybody knew that this was going to be a tense election process as well, uh, counting process as well, but this was a particularly tense uh, electoral campaign period. Um, uh, the uh, Biden camp kept uh, kept its campaign as campaign narrative quite well disciplined. So they tried to also um, tone down the tensions, tensions, but uh, they also tried to keep the campaign 
in on COVID issues and on health national healthcare issues where they win more better they win more they are in better shape uh, in public opinion uh, and also they try to avoid uh, controversial issues like rearranging and reorganizing Supreme Court if they uh, get a hold of both presidency and the Senate because that way they could. They could, uh, they could rearrange the uh, Supreme Court and break the conservative hold there. So they tried to keep the issues away from the Supreme Court issues, many controversial issues, and uh, they tried to keep it uh, in the COVID and national healthcare issues. Uh, Trump, on the other hand, tried to keep it in economy, on economy, tried to keep the, his message on economy. He tried to uh, belittle, uh, belittle liberals and uh, upon his opponents as uh, for taking too seriously health issues. He tried to uh, understate the risk of COVID, um, and this may not have. Also, he also kept his anti-establishment rhetoric, and he depicted uh, Biden as an insider, as in politics for over forty years, and he himself as an outsider, although he is holding the position of the presidency, obviously, for the, first, for the last four years. So this, um, this COVID, anti-COVID message, uh, many pundits and public opinion uh, polls, uh, poll uh, experts uh, said that uh, he, he, it did not work well for him to talk about COVID, especially when he got uh, diagnosed with COVID, that hurt him. But I believe that there was, there was also that part of, part of the message also uh, kept his constituency intact because he managed to make his constituency bel belittle COVID too. So he also scared, like he connected that issue with the economy, and he said that if he, um, if Biden comes to power, Democrats come to power, they are going to close down the close down the uh, economy. So they are going to hurt the nation. So that was like a, already a super tense uh, campaign period. And then, of course, elections uh, became even more, uh, electoral process became even more uh, tense, intense. Um, do you want me to talk a little bit about the electoral process? Um, yeah, sure, that'd be great. I mean, if you could just perhaps uh, tell us what's been going on since Tuesday. I know the, the, the votes are not in, the results are not in yet, but perhaps uh, what's been going yeah. on for the last two days in uh, your, you know, the atmosphere in general. Sure, yeah. The, it, first of all, the... Um, Trump campaign, throughout his campaign, he uh, always implied that there would be, uh, elections would be rigged. Uh, the election, there was always like uh, this mess, this, part, this was always uh, a part of his message that uh, Democrats are trying to steal the election. Um, and it was, he already had prepared his uh, constituency uh, for that. And then he built on it after the elections, right? Uh, so the, uh, there were a, a couple of um, maneuvers that the uh, Republican Party and the uh, Trump administration uh, carried out. One of them was to, uh, to make sure that, was to make sure that uh, the, uh, the constituency is prepared for an, an electoral result process where Republican Party is going to be ahead in many, uh, many states at the beginning, at least, and it's going to be also dragged out uh, and Democrats will be climbing up uh, slowly. So they first slow down the process in uh, the state legislatures that they control because the uh, electoral counting process uh, goes through the states and state uh, regulations. So they, when they, whenever they could control either through the courts or uh, through the legislatures, they try to make sure that um, mail ballots, mail-in ballots, which Democrats prefer much more heavily, uh, would not be counted uh, until later. So they tried to first of all do that. And then on top of that, uh, knowing that Democrats are going to prefer uh, mail ballots much more uh, disproportionately, they also uh, said that uh, mail ballots will be rigged and so like anticipating the results to be like this. And it was part of the, um, part of the narrative and then on Tuesday, we learned that Florida uh, did not go uh, towards Biden. Uh, towards Biden, if Florida went towards Biden, I think they would uh, accept defeat, and this will be a much uh, less intense process. Uh, but when Florida did not go towards Biden, Biden because Florida's regulations uh, allow Florida to uh, announce the results early, but that did not uh, when that did not happen. Uh, it 
was clear that Biden had to have a good uh, margin in Arizona, in Georgia, uh, uh, or uh, in North Carolina. That did not happen either. That did not happen either. So when he could not win Florida and he could not clearly, Biden could not clearly win uh, the, the other three states that, would, that were likely to announce its their results early, except a small, uh, small portion of it, then it became a contested election where northern, northern and mid north midwestern states uh, were slow in counting. We knew that they were going to be slow in counting because the Republican efforts there were paid off uh, before the election. And we are in a very tense, very intense electoral process where uh, Donald Trump is saying that uh, he just said like a few, um, yeah. in a few of his messages yeah. uh, that uh, this is a rigged election, election, they are stealing votes, Democrats are stealing votes, uh, there are, uh, even polls are uh, just carried out for voter suppression, all yeah. of those, because voters were showing him seven points to uh, seven, eight points on average be, uh, behind, and he is going to end up with a five points behind, it looks like. Uh, so five points behind in national popular vote is not enough to make an election clear because of the water distribution patterns in the United States. So Democrats needed more than five points uh, national percentage advantage to be able to win clearly the elections. Mm -hmm. And uh, that did not happen. It looks like it's gonna be around five points, the difference. So here we are. Yeah, so we, there's still a, a couple of, perhaps another day of this uh, back and forth and, uh, you know, hopefully in the next day or so, things uh, will be more clear. And uh, and uh, but yes, it doesn't look like it's going to be easy, and it doesn't look like it's going to. Or if if Trump does end up uh, losing, he's not going to go easy. Um, I'd like to come and, and and to the Turkey U.S. relations and the likelihood of a Biden presidency. Now, many are speculating that a Biden presidency would not be necessarily good for Turkey. As a matter of fact, uh, not only Turkey, but President Erdogan himself is among the heads of state that stand to lose the most with the Trump loss. What do you think? In what ways will a Biden administration change U.S.-Turkey relations? Um, also, keeping in mind perhaps uh, if it's you know the, the difference or similarities between what is good for Turkey, the Turkish Republic, and for President Erdogan. Yeah. Um, okay. All of these. Uh, national interest is the key verb here probably. And national interest is an abstraction at the end. And uh, national interest is a contested, uh, contested subject, right? So uh, different sectors, different classes, different uh, groups within the society are going to uh, prioritize different, uh, different goods as national, uh, national uh, interests. Uh, some are going to prioritize peace and compromise and negotiation and diplomacy, some others are going to uh, prioritize uh, pursuit of power, but it depends on uh, what, uh, what, what your national interest, uh, national interest definition is, what you prioritize as national interest. So in terms of, uh, this, that's the first part. So in, in, if we uh, break down Turkey's national interest, Turkey's national interest could be like, uh, you could think of Turkey as a mid-sized country, living in a, a relatively peaceful environment as much as possible, like it affecting its own environment in a more peaceful manner, uh, intervening less, less interventionist uh, towards its uh, neighbors and towards its uh, region, in its region, uh, but also uh, living as a peaceful uh, nation with a good representation in uh, multilateral organizations. But that's not, uh, that's not necessarily a national interest uh, uh, national interest conception of all parties within the within Turkey, right? Uh, so, Turkish uh, foreign policy. So, we should first break down in terms of what national interest is for different groups, but also like particularistic interests and national interests are often overlapping in the especially in the rhetoric of uh, politicians. So. Uh, especially in countries like Turkey, where uh, power concentration is in massive uh, proportions. Uh, so and power concentration, not only in institutions, but also in a single person. So when power is concentrated so much in a single institution, 
there is, uh, and also that when that institution has all that power to propagate his own position and uh, uh, frame his own position as the national post, national interest, then of course the, uh, the the individual particularistic interest and national interest starts to be conflated. So that's probably what is happening in terms of uh, in uh, dynamics in Turkey uh, about the uh, US, US elections, right? Um, groups that are uh, supporting uh, Erdogan are believing, uh, believe that uh, Turkey's national interest is um, lies with Trump. Although uh, even in that sense, it is a controversial issue. So like, even if we take this national interest abstraction and make it about the power of, the, uh, of Turkey and then uh, only about power, not about peace, multilateralism, democracy, diplomacy, but only about power and uh, use of military force, stuff like that. Even if we take it, narrow it down that way, still within the group or within the country also, we are talking about uh, Erdogan's interest and Erdogan's uh, environment's interest. So um, in that sense, even uh, Trump administration is not necessarily a good thing, even for their own particularistic interest, uh, it may not be as good as uh, they think, uh, at least his followers think, um, because uh, Trump administration also has some uh, personalistic tendencies. Uh, even if he's, uh, he's not living in a country that, is not, that power is not checked, and his power is quite a bit checked actually, even in his, uh, his supporters in the Senate, uh, many times stopped him from doing certain, uh, taking certain actions. Uh, but still, uh, his personalistic style, his personalistic style, and he has also the, uh, as a pre president of the United States on the foreign policy issues, he has the, uh, he has the uh, advantage of uh, moving first and determining the agenda. So in that type of context, what we are seeing is a president that has an authoritarian style and that's quite erratic. So if that kind of erratic, uh, erratic player uh, cannot be necessarily construed as a stable partner of a country like Turkey, where Turkey is at the end in terms of uh, power consideration in lower power than the United States. So you probably don't want a more stable, balanced uh, superpower uh, rather than a more erratic, less uh, more uh, unstable and um, um, unbalanced uh, presidency. Mm -hmm. So in terms of long-term Turkish interest, but also even the, for the particularistic interest of the ruling groups in Turkey, uh, Trump is uh, not necessarily a safe, may not necessarily be a safe bet. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, thank you for mentioning that. I mean, the relationship between Trump and Erdogan has been characterized with a lot of ups and downs. I'm thinking about, you know, the letter uh, Trump sent Erdogan uh, uh, last October in 2019, uh, you know, where he, you know, threatened to threaten, uh, threatened to destroy the Turkish economy. But at the same time, there are s several times where he's also stated that, you know, Erdogan was a great leader and a great friend and so forth. So as, as you say, it's, it's, not, it's not very stable. Um, on the other end, we have Biden who speaks about restoring commitment to, his, their, to, to the United States' alliances such as NATO and so forth and putting diplomacy at the forefront once again in its foreign policy. So if Biden is elected, then can we say, um, you know, the relationships will not continue on a personal level, but institutions will, will be once again included in the equation? Sure, uh, like institutions, both international institutions mm -hmm. will be, uh, but also it's probably going to be slightly more stable. Uh, I mean, presidency at the end has a lot of advantages uh, in determining foreign policy in the United States. Still, uh, the Congress, it, which will look likely to be uh, Senate, especially, will likely be uh, in the hands of Republicans. So he's going to have to both uh, more negotiate more. Uh, domestically, he's going to be also probably less uh, less authoritarian in style uh, and um, less arbitrary in his style as well. Uh, so uh, he's also going to use institutional channels more uh, than uh, Donald Trump's, like international institutions, but also uh, domestic institutions. So both domestic institutions will moderate and will make it the checks and balances within the country. Even in foreign policy making in the United States, there are quite a few uh, checks, check mechanisms, as you know. Uh, so 
uh, he's gonna be more uh, reliant on them or he's gonna be more bound by them. Uh, he's gonna be more bound by them, but also, uh, but also in terms of international institutions, he's going to be a more uh, institutional oriented, uh, institutional oriented probably. Uh, so the point is we are talking about relations, right? So we cannot say necessarily, um, necessarily uh, US is going to do this, uh, uh, Trump is going to do this, Biden is going to do this vis-a-vis -vis Turkey. So at the end, we are talking about uh, internal and foreign relations. And so uh, it depends on what uh, Turkish, Turkish side does, how they approach right to the, uh, to the issues at hand. So um, Erdogan and uh, Turkish foreign policy circles, they can determine a way to be viable probably. And there are, I bet there are uh, avenues that uh, they can make it work. So there is no uh, such thing like it depends on the orientations of Turkey, of course, it orientations of Turkey. And so uh, I would say like, because it's one thing to talk about the issues that are present now, it's something else to talk about issues that, are, that may come up that we don't know now, uh, two years from now, right? So if we are, we don't know which issues we are dealing with, two years from now, Turkey, uh, acting through institutional channels as a moderate, uh, moderate, slightly principled, slightly power-seeking, power-seeking um, country as such. If they Turkey plays uh, as such the game, two years from now, Biden administration may be an easier partner to deal with on an issue that, like in two thousand eight nine, we did not know that Syria was going to be Syria, right? So Syrian issue, Syria issue uh, exploded. And then Turkey, uh, so we are thinking about something like that. Two years from now, it is a like, there is a good likelihood that an, an important event, foreign policy event is going to occur. In that event, I would say probably it would be better for Turkish side, depending on how Turkey approaches the issue, obviously, and uh, US, uh, but it would be probably more uh, easier to deal with a Biden administration than a Trump administration. But of course, these are guesses. These are guesses because we don't know how Turkey is going to behave either. Yes, and we don't, yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, in the likelihood of a Biden administration, Tur Turkey might have to reconsider certain foreign policy, the current foreign policy path that it's, it has undertaken. But what, and you know, we, as we said, we don't know the results yet, but there might, you know, there's still possibility that uh, there might be a Trump uh, presidency again for the next four years. So uh, do you think the Turkish attitude will change uh, according to the president of the United States? Uh, I, I actually uh, don't have a good guess on this issue. Um, I, um, look, the thing is, uh, first of all, it depends on uh, what, like, there are not only two options. Of course, like we are assuming here that Trump is going to win a, a, the elections and, or Biden is going to win the elections. Those two are the options, but uh, no matter who wins, it's also possible that the US is going to go through an upheaval, a period of unrest. Right, uh, that is still in the books, and as the election drags on, uh, that uh, that uh, possibility is that potential is increasing. I'm not saying that the probability is increasing. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it, it's probable. It's probable now, and the probability is increasing as the election drags on. And um, so, divided power within the uh, U.S. in the case of Biden. Uh, Biden might make it easy for Turkey to reposition uh, itself uh, according to the uh, according to uh, U.S. politics. Uh, the the thing is, um, Turkey also has other commitments. So Turkey has other uh, relationships that they are bound, and the Syrian issue, especially Syrian foreign policy, is uh, binding Turkey quite a bit. So. Um, it may be hard even with the Biden administration uh, for Turkey to uh, change its positions, but also Turkey's domestic uh, domestic institutional uh, framework right now uh, is not very easy, uh, very easy to have a stable foreign policy uh, without, uh, without prioritizing, uh, forming a stable foreign policy without prioritizing domestic politics. So uh, this, that's also, that's a bind that Turkey 
uh, is facing right now, even if they make a commitment, uh, they may need to prioritize domestic, domestic issues uh, and uh, domestic concerns. But still, if Turkey plays its uh, cards right, I don't think its uh, Biden administration is going to be uh, adversely affecting Turkey necessarily. You know, Suzanne, thank you so much for having joined us this evening. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Our second guest this evening is Sinan Akgunay. Sinan Akgunay is an economist and a frequent contributor to Medioscope TV. Good evening, Mr. Akgunay. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah. So we don't have the results yet, obviously, but uh, we'll still try and talk about the likelihood of either scenario. So at the moment, Trump and Erdogan have had so far a personal relationship, but it has not always worked out for Turkey. We have seen, as a matter of fact, how a single tweet from Trump has affected uh, the Turkish economy. On the other hand, Trump has not been very vocal in terms of criticizing Erdogan for his authoritarianism and breaches of you know, public expression and human rights and so forth. So um, would you say overall that the current uh, status of the Turkish-American relationship is in a good place? And how will this status quo be impacted by the result? Well, the Turkish-American relationship has uh, seen a lot of ups and downs during the last four or five years, and uh, Trump has been at the center of this. We witnessed that, I mean, uh, the deterioration in the relationship has started before Trump, but during the Trump era, the relationship has uh, seen major shifts, major changes uh, in its dynamics. We've seen that due to both Turkey and the United States uh, that the policy making, the policy cycles within the foreign policy network has changed. We, we've seen that uh, within Turkish American relations, uh, relations, uh, informal channels have started taking the place of formal channels. We've seen less diplomacy. We've seen more personal relationships, as you asked. We've seen uh, that the relationship between Erdogan and uh, Trump or the relationship between uh, Kushner and other individual actors uh, has played an important role in the relationship. Uh, if we're looking at whether the relationships are good or has it been good during the Trump era, we've seen that as you uh, asked in your question, uh, there have been very low points in these relationships. Uh, in 2018, uh, it was due to Trump's comments or Trump's actions that the Turkish economy uh, went into a currency crisis. Even if Turkish economy was not in a good position, even if it was going to go into a currency crisis at some point, uh, what triggered this was Trump's actions at that point. That aside, uh, what Erdogan benefit, uh, benefited from or what Turkey benefited from uh, within this relationship is that he uh, established a good individual relationship with uh, Trump. And uh, Trump also uh, emphasized the importance of the, his relationship with Erdogan in a lot of occasions. And due to this relationship, Erdogan was able to achieve some important goals for himself within, maybe we can talk later, the Hawkbank case or the uh, sanctions regarding the S-400 systems, uh, or possibly uh, the situation uh, within Syria. And in all of these cases, Erdogan was able to communicate with Trump directly and achieve something. As a result, uh, we can say that uh, Turkey didn't face the uh, sanctions or didn't face the legal outcomes that it would normally have faced. But in total, is the relationship good between Turkey and the United States? Uh, the relationship is not institutional. Uh, it's dependent on uh, individual unforeseeable actors. Therefore, it's not sustainable. Um, so as a matter of fact, uh, I mean, from where you left off, uh, Biden has underlined that uh, if he were to uh, be elected president, he would uh, reconsult, uh, you know, under, put the uh, uh, institutional relationships 
uh, more to the front. So, you know, reconsolidate NATO and his, their other uh, alliances. Mm -hmm. So if Biden were to be elected, would this be perhaps more beneficial for Turkey in the long run? And is there, in that sense, a difference between what is beneficial for Turkey and what would be beneficial for Erdogan? Well, if uh, Biden is elected, and it seems so, uh, there's going to be a major uh, change in his uh, foreign policy attitude when compared with Trump. Uh, as you said, he's going to have a more institutional structure. He's going to emphasize uh, multilateralism. Uh, he's going to uh, join the global uh, concerns, join the global agreements, which uh, Trump uh, left. He's going to uh, be a part of the World Health Organization, or he's going to uh, work with his traditional allies. And perhaps he's going to align with these allies in various uh, policies, various uh, causes around the world, including uh, the Middle East, including Russia. He's going to uh, hold a stronger position against Russia, uh, even if uh, he has similar positions with Trump in certain cases. Uh, for example, in China, uh, he will have a more institutional and more multilateral approach. In this context, uh, how his relationship will change with Turkey? Uh, well, uh, in Trump, Erdogan relationships, we emphasize that there was an informal channel. Uh, there was less diplomacy. There were more individual relationships. Between Biden and uh, Turkey relationships, we will see that the uh, formal channels uh, are more activated. There will be more diplomacy. Uh, Erdogan won't be able to perhaps uh, call Biden and achieve uh, policy goals regarding the sanctions or regarding the uh, Hoffman case, for example. Uh, there, were, there will be uh, an active dynamic structure within the formal institutional structures. Uh, we will be emphasizing the uh, foreign affairs developments more in comparison with the uh, Trump era. Uh, therefore, will it be beneficial for Turkey? Uh, will it be beneficial for Erdogan? If we're looking at this, uh, we can say that in the short run, the Turkey-US relationships, it is clear that it's gonna go through a bumpy road. I mean, there are a lot of issues that uh, lie ahead uh, of both actors. And uh, Biden is not an individual who's uh, unknowledgeable about Turkey. Mm -hmm. He knows Turkey very well. Uh, we know uh, some people from his foreign policy team and they're familiar with Turkey as well. And on the other hand, Erdogan is familiar with Biden as well. Uh, they have an uh, idea about each other. They know uh, what each other can do. Uh, therefore, uh, in consideration of the important cases, important uh, subjects that lie ahead, uh, the relationships uh, will go through a volatile period. Having said this, uh, we can also emphasize that uh, the relationships will be more institutionalized, more coordinated. So therefore, for and because uh, Biden will uh, emphasize the importance of multilateral structures, including NATO, uh, Turkey is an important part of NATO. Therefore, uh, there have to be there has to be uh, uh, good. There has to be some relationship within NATO. Turkey is an important part of NATO. Biden knows this as well. So uh, yes, there are some uh, downsides. There is going to be a bumpy road. But meanwhile, uh, there has to be some relationships uh, that has to be built. And lastly, perhaps uh, we can talk about the uh, indirect uh, effects that US foreign policy may have on Turkey. For example, uh, the US will have a new relation or the, uh, the United States will restore its relationship with the uh, European Union and its allies in the European Union. Therefore, uh, perhaps France's position within the EU 
will change as opposed to Germany. This will impact Turkey or uh, the United States will have a stronger position against Russia. And the United States have a, will have a different approach on Iran. Therefore, all of these will affect uh, Turkey and perhaps it will, be, it will uh, result with an uh, opportunity for Turkey as well. So in short, we can say that, uh, in short, we can say that uh, in the short run, uh, I'm assuming that we're gonna go through a bumpy road. It's gonna be a hard period. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps uh, in the, I'm assuming that uh, after Biden takes office, uh, he will reach out to Turkey, reach mm -hmm. out to Erdogan. Uh, a communication will be established. Uh, a new restored relationship, uh, perhaps a new status quo will try to be established and uh, we will see how things go from there. Among, amongst perhaps some of the uh, things that will contribute to this bumpiness at the beginning is perhaps this, this, this issue of uh, sanctions. The US Congress wants to uh, Im uh, impose sanctions on Turkey, especially after Turkey tested the S-400 missile system in Sinop a couple of weeks ago. And mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, Erdogan recently said, you know, uh, the tests have been have been and are being conducted. Whatever your sanctions are, don't hold back. Now, um, I, I don't know if Erdogan said this, assuming that uh, Trump will continue holding off the U.S. Congress as he's done so far. Uh, but do you think there will be perhaps a softening on uh, Erdogan's behalf now that uh, there is the very likelihood that Biden will be elected? And will Biden uh, have the same attitude um, in terms of putting off these sanctions, or do you think they'll actually, uh, they'll, they'll go through with it? Um, I don't think he will have the same attitude regarding the sanctions, but I think uh, in his first months, as I said, he will reach out to Erdogan and uh, he will try to establish a, a middle point with Turkey. Uh, if not reached, I'm assuming that uh, he will gradually impose sanctions, uh, not at a single period, but uh, he will gradually impose sanctions. I don't think uh, he will have the same attitude towards these san sanctions as Erdogan. And uh, together with that, we know that there's a bipartisan support towards the sanctions in the United States. Uh, therefore, the Congress is pressuring the presidency as well. And, uh, Biden will also be impacted by this. Uh, in the Trump era, the storyline was not like this. Trump uh, was holding a more transactional-based uh, foreign policy structure, and uh, Turkey was included in this as well. And uh, as we discussed in the prior question, Erdogan was benefiting from this because it was due to this transactional approach that the, Q, uh, the two leaders were communicating so well and so on. Um, on the Turkish side, uh, I'm, ass uh, I'm assuming that the rhetoric uh, will soften a bit. Uh, it's real, really dependent on the uh, geopolitical developments. There are a lot of things going on, but uh, on the uh, other hand, there's the economic situation in Turkey as well. Uh, therefore, uh, a sanction will have major negative economic impacts on Turkey. Uh, it's not a uh, do whatever you want, I'll move on thing. Therefore, uh, we'll see where things go. I mean, uh, from a sovereign, yeah, I mean. Uh, so these sanctions should, a, should be taken a, seriously. I mean, because if they do go ahead, uh, whether it's gradually uh, and, you know, over time, you know, there, there will be serious impacts on the economy, which is already, uh, you know, not doing so great. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it should be taken seriously. I think uh, the policymakers in Ankara will take it seriously. Uh, but I'm not sure if uh, they, even if taken seriously, uh, they will try to reach a middle ground with the United States. But I'm sure that uh, in the first six to nine months, uh, the two leaders will reach out and try to reach a, a center ground. Uh, 
hopefully uh, something will be reached and the sanctions will not be imposed because uh, even uh, if even with the word of the sanctions, even with a, a minimum sanction imposition, the economy is uh, hit. If you recall in 2018, uh, with the words of Trump, uh, there was a major uh, depreciation in the Turkish lira. There was uh, a major outflow from Turkey. And this really hits the Turkish economy. This creates inflation, this creates other aspects. Therefore, uh, given the situation in Turkey right now, I'm assuming uh, that the two leaders will reach out. But as I said, this is a major issue for Turkey. This is a major issue for the United States. And uh, even with an optimistic perspective, uh, this will create a volatile situation between the two countries. Um, Mr. Akinayt, I'd also like to ask you about the Halkbank case. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, prosecutors in New York opened a case against uh, the state-run Halkbank in October of last year for its alleged role in helping Iran evade U.S. sanctions. Um, and there was a new investigation that was carried out by the New York Times a couple of weeks ago, I think it, it came out, or last week, which detailed how Trump had moved to shut down an, uh, the investigation and pressure federal prosecutors to go easy on the bank upon Erdogan's request. So all these kind of uh, things you mentioned earlier regarding the, the, in, the, these informer channels and individual relations seem to have uh, also taken their toll um, in, this, in this case. So what, uh, what will happen to the skates uh, in, the, in, in the likelihood of Biden's win? Well, um, Biden is very familiar with this case also. Mm -hmm. It started during the uh, Obama administration. Uh, regarding the article uh, you talked about in New York Times, uh, it's a clear representation of uh, how things worked between Turkey and uh, uh, between Turkey and Trump during the Trump era. Uh, it was all based on individual actions. It was uh, all transactional, as I said. Uh, Trump clearly, uh, Trump cr clearly uh, moved on to the case, the Hulkbank case, and uh, tried to prevent a negative outcome. Uh, and we know from this article and prior articles that Erdogan has, has been requesting this for quite some time. Uh, therefore, I don't think in the Biden uh, administration, the process will flow like this. I think, uh, I'm not sure how, what the uh, final positioning of the case will be within the Biden administration, but uh, I'm assuming that uh, there will be more as I said in prior questions as well, but there will be more institutional relationships and it's not an individual favor you're asking for. And at the end of the day, I think uh, the legal system will have to make a decision. Uh, I'm, as I said, I'm not sure uh, what the outcome of this case will be, but uh, I think I'm assuming that when Biden comes, uh, he won't try to prevent the negative outcome as much. But putting this aside, uh, I believe that the uh, Katza case, uh, the sanctions uh, are a more primary issue within the two relationship. Uh, and do you think in this regard, the current issues on the agenda for both countries in terms of their foreign policies will change? Uh, with the with a new kind of uh, presidency of Biden. Um, well, Turkey has in foreign policy. Turkey has been active in uh, various areas, uh, either uh, very active or minimal. But uh, Turkey is concerned with uh, various regions uh, within its uh, landscape, and uh, there are 
various issues, geopolitical issues, uh, which is bothering Turkey. I'm assuming that uh, Turkey's foreign policy in a regional sense will change, especially uh, in its neighborhood, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I'm assuming that under the Biden administration, Biden uh, will continue some of Trump's uh, policy de decisions, which he made both in the Middle East or Central Asia uh, or um, China, but uh, he will, he will uh, take a more leading position. He will be uh, more proactive. And uh, as a result, I'm assuming that with the uh, strong position he holds, he will hold against Russia. I'm assuming that uh, the foreign policy agendas won't change between the two countries, but due to the changing structures within the foreign policy and due to the changing policy cycle of the United States af after the Trump era and uh, with the uh, re-establish alignments with Biden and other uh, allies or other actors, I'm assuming that there will be the same cases, but uh, there will be new positionings, there will be new interactions, uh, which may have negative outcomes or which may create opportunities. Uh, Sinan Akkun, I thank you so much for having joined us this evening. Thank you for having me. That's all from This Week in Turkey. See you next Friday at 9 p.m. Good night.